welcome to the Get Fit with Jodell show. I'm Jodell as usual, and I am pleased to have back with me Georgie Dinkoff, who is my leading authority when it comes to learning all things pertaining to metabolic health and how the body functions and hormone health. And I think you're really going to enjoy them too. We're going to be talking about serotonin, anxiety, um, and as it relates to, you know, do we really need as much serotonin as mainstream dogma kind of tells us? So Georgie's going to fill us in on that. So thank you for joining, joining me, Georgie. Georgie, um, can you briefly just tell the listeners who you are if they haven't seen our previous podcasts? Uh, yeah, basically, I, uh, I'm a hacker by trade. Uh, <laughs> computer science and math is my academic background. But uh, since 2002, um, I've been basically working in biochemistry circles. And I've been um, reading and studying on my own and, and doing a lot of experimentation. Um, I, I guess the word for that would be biohacking. Yeah. Um, and I post uh, quite a few studies on my blog and on the repeat forum. And I started following the repeat ideas and diet around 2011. Um, it helped me recover from, um, you know, really um, severe conditions that I that some doctors thought would be like the beginning stages of, of multiple sclerosis. Mm. Um, so, you know, little by little, I started uncovering a lot of these uh, truths, so to speak, that... Uh, a lot of the stuff that we're being told by our, by our doctors or that we see on the news, it's really not that 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 correct. And in fact, the dogma that's being sold to us on a daily basis has very little evidence behind it. Um, and and one of the um, one of the most uh, dogmatic aspects of medicine these days is just as you mentioned, the benefits of serotonin. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people have heard about it as the happiness hormone, mm -hmm. but in reality, nothing can be further from the truth. Its original name in medicine uh, was enteramin because it was known to be a hormone-like substance produced mostly in the gastrointestinal tract. About 90% of the serotonin that's produced in your body is produced in the intestine. Um, and it was known since the early 40s that enteramin, which we now know as serotonin, mm -hmm. is actually uh, in, in moderate or small to moderate amounts is responsible for proper peristalsis. But in elevated amounts, in elevated levels, in the, uh, which you can get easily by exposing yourself to these serotonergic drugs and serotonergic supplements and foods, it is really, it's a really dangerous chemical that easily causes fibrosis of pretty much any organ where it happens to accumulate. Um, and these drugs that are being sold to people uh, that are purportedly uh, effective at curing depression, some of them have an antidepressant effect, but I guarantee you it's not because, of, because they raise serotonin. In fact, their serotonergic properties are largely responsible for some of the terrible side effects um, that, are, that are seen with these drugs, which medicine continues to deny. Mm -hmm. But uh, quietly, large companies like Pfizer are running trials with drugs that block serotonin in order to reverse these very same side effects that, we, that we've been given by the drugs. So it's really very nefarious. They're kind of selling you both the poison and the remedy and, and, and telling you all along that all of these side effects that you're getting it's based on your genes or, you know, poor lifestyle choices or pretty much it's all your fault. Um, and it's, it has nothing to do with the drugs. Um, so I've been, I've been reading about this and researching for over 10 years. And I can tell that serotonin together with estrogen is perhaps the most fraudulently marketed and, 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 um, and, and the therapeutically enforced substance um, that is medically available. Both serotonin itself and drugs that act like serotonin or increase its synthesis or decrease its degradation. All of these chemicals will have virtually the same effect. It's increasing your serotonergic tone. Um, so that has, that has been something that I've been seeing over the last 10 to 15 years based on my research. Um, and the evidence is really, is really overwhelming, especially if you go to older studies uh, from the 1970s back to all the way down to the 1920s. I mean, the evidence was overwhelming. Um, um, all doctors were saying that you should not do anything that increases serotonin chronically because mm -hmm. it basically turns you into a zombie, like a hibernating squirrel. Um, you're capable of almost nothing except, uh, you know, eating, um, you know, basically eating, drinking and, and, and doing, doing grunt work. That's what serotonin is good for. And most hibernating animals, since I already mentioned it, they, they actually start hibernation uh, by increasing their endogenous levels of serotonin. So mm -hmm. clearly something, something that makes you hibernate and be completely unproductive for you know, several months out of the year 
is probably not something you want to um, elevate chronically inside of yourself on a, on a daily basis. Well, there's a lot to that because if we take a look at the people around the world, there are quite a few people who probably have high serotonin based on the zombie level we see today. And I had thought it was maybe due to everybody's got their little rectangle in their hand that they're addicted to, you know, the social media and everything. <laughs> but maybe it really does have to do with the fact that their serotonin's That's too right. elevated. And so it is a key neurotransmitter, correct? Because when I was taught in nutrition like lectures and seminars and all the training I attended, they push it on you. They push this dogma of you got to increase serotonin and ser serotonin is the precursor to melatonin and things like that. So I was taught differently, but what you're saying makes much more sense. And when, like I, like you mentioned the research, when I went back and actually looked at that research, like from the seventies, like you mentioned, it made complete sense and it's just not talked about. So can you tell me, like, is there a benefit to a balance of serotonin and does it have some place in the body other than kind of that hibernation you mean you, you mentioned? So, so uh, as I mentioned, since its original name was enteramin, uh, mm -hmm. the, the science behind it originally, which was, which was not as biased as it is today, basically discovered that its major role is ensuring proper uh, intestinal movement, basically mm -hmm. peristalsis. Okay. Um, so in, in a certain amount, uh, I think serotonin does have a role, but it has a very intimate connection with nitric oxide and endotoxin, both of which are now known to be highly uh, pat pathogenic, pathological in elevated amounts. And basically anything, anytime, ser uh, anytime endotoxin gets into your bloodstream, um, you start synthesizing serotonin. Okay. Um, and, and serotonin basically in very small amounts, the, 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 the basically the, just like you said, I wouldn't call it a balance. I would say the minimum amount that, that, that allows for proper intestinal movement would be the optimum, optimal amount. Mm -hmm. And I want to draw a parallel with the metabolic theory of health just to give an example why excess serotonin is not good. Serotonin and dopamine have an inverse relationship. Basically, right. one suppresses the other mm -hmm. and you know, they mutually suppress each other's effects and synthesis. Um, so if we, if we, and since we already discussed that it, it is good to have high slash fast metabolism, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, uh, it's important to know that serotonin is perhaps the cardinal suppressor of metabolism wow. while yeah. dopamine does the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically that's why hiber hibernating animals elevate their serotonin before going to sleep is because clearly if you have limited uh, food reserves store the static tissue in your body. You don't want your metabolism to be high while hibernating because you're going to use them up very quickly and you'll mm -hmm. have to wake up in the middle of winter when there's no food and you'll probably starve to death. So mm -hmm. that's what serotonin really does in, 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 the, in the amounts that are being uh, advertised as being good for us. This, this will powerfully suppress your, your metabolism. On top of that, serotonin elevates the synthesis of nitric oxide and, and sort of turns on this inflammatory cascade it increases pretty much every known inflammatory biomarker, including mm -hmm. the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes. There um, is there's there is something called tumor necrosis factor alpha. It uh, serotonin increases its levels too. There is something else called nuclear factor KB, uh, another master uh, inflammatory biomarker. Serotonin increases that one as well. Um, and then serotonin also is the primary promoter of synthesis of, of cortisol, of glucocorticoid. Mm. And in fact, um, a psychiatry has recently recognized that, that depression may very well be an endocrine condition and, and not so much a neurotransmitter condition. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, and psychiatry has freely admitted that excess cortisol readily causes depression. Well, if serotonin is one of the most potent, if not the most potent, um, um, sort of enhancer of cortisol synthesis, then you can immediately see that serotonin is probably something that's not very good for your depression. In fact, it may very well be causing it. Um, and uh, just for the record, many of the drugs that are being sold to the public as being serotonergic, they indeed are, but their mechanism of action for depression actually turns out to be their partial serotonin antagonists. And mm -hmm. specifically, the, what, the most successful ones block one of the serotonin receptors which is responsible for increasing the synthesis of cortisol. Mm -hmm. So all of the all of the successful antidepressant drugs are in effect drugs that limit the synthesis of cortisol by blocking serotonin. So just this picture, it lowers powerfully lowers metabolism, 
uh, increases the synthesis of the stress hormones and basically initiates the stress cascade by increasing the synthesis of cortisol. It increases all of the known major inflammatory biomarkers. It increases basically the, uh, the synthesis of nitric oxide. It is the cardinal profibrotic chemical in the body. Uh, so anytime you have an organ that has fibrosis, uh, it, serotonin is involved one way or another. And in fact, uh, Pfizer is running currently clinical trials with a drug that blocks a specific serotonin receptor, 2B. It's, it's the 5-HT2B receptor. And drugs that block this receptor reverse even established fibrosis in the liver, where it, where it is known as cirrhosis, in the heart, where it's known as heart failure, congestive heart failure, in the lungs, where it's known as pulmonary fibrosis, often accompanied by pulmonary arterial hypertension. All of these are lethal diseases. And, and if a drug that blocks serotonin effectively reverses them, then you can imagine what serotonin itself does. It yeah. basically causes all of these conditions. So the elevated serotonin then uh, creates the stress response to where the cortisol comes up uh, in response to the stress. And then, yep. like you said, it also is kind of goes in tandem with elevated estrogen as well. Right. That's when right. we see a slowed down metabolic system. We see an increased stress response and we see more weight gain that way too, I'm assuming. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And like when you mentioned uh, inflammation, CRP, would that go up too? Would people see on their blood work that C the, the C-reactive protein would go up as well with elevated serotonin? Yes. Okay. Yes, I mentioned TNF-alpha. So mm -hmm. TNF-alpha and CRP are almost perfectly correlated. Okay. Anytime one of them goes up, the other one will go up as well. Uh, and in fact, both of these, TNF-alpha and CRP, are biomarkers for a number of autoimmune conditions, uh, uh, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. lupus, Schongren syndrome, uh, um, I think psoriasis as well. Right. And all of these are basically autoimmune conditions that at their core have the elevated estrogen, serotonin, nitric oxide cascade. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is, is one of the key mediators of all of these uh, conditions. And in general, it does the stress reaction. And it, the, the other nasty thing about it is that it forms a positive feedback loop with cortisol. So serotonin promotes cortisol, and cortisol also turns on the enzyme in the brain and in the, and in the GI tract. It's called tryptophan hydroxylase. That enzyme synthesizes serotonin from tryptophan. So cortisol increases the synthesis of serotonin. Then, of course, serotonin increases the synthesis of cortisol even more. And on and on it goes until if, you, if any of these hormones that promote each other synthesis gets up to a specific level to be on a certain level, you get the homicidal, violent behavior, and psychosis, um, specifically the, the psychotic diseases like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. uh, and some, some of the bipolar conditions also have psychosis as a side effect. And serotonin is behind all of these conditions. For a long time, psychotic conditions were treated with drugs that were being marketed as dopamine antagonists. Mm -hmm. The medicine was telling us, no, it's dopamine that's causing the psychosis. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that that's not true because if you look at the older studies, you'll see that Psychosis was always triggered by serotonin in, in, in these studies from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 60s, all the way up to the 70s. And then recently, what, the flagship drug for treating psychosis known as haloperidol, uh, they, they changed quietly the Wikipedia page about it and put a table in there which shows how this drug really works. And it turns out it blocks every single serotonin receptor. Mm -hmm. So it does block dopamine receptors as well, but it's also a powerful serotonin antagonist. So the public is being sold on this idea that dopamine uh, is kind of makes you crazy, impulsive, uncontrollable, et cetera, et cetera, while serotonin calms you down and, and, and you know, makes you a nice citizen. Well, I guess that's one way to put it. Um, my view would be that dopamine makes you a nice, gregarious, creative, warm, and loving person, while serotonin turns you into an obedient zombie. And I think that's what, that's what powers that we really want from us. They just want us to work and spend and not really question the status quo. Um, wow. And just as a side note, where all this came from, um, there was a big push back in the 60s during this, the civil rights movement and the, in general, the anti-establishment movement known as the, is the hippie movement. Um, they were very big on using uh, LSD, mm -hmm. also known as acid, because mm -hmm. the, the, the name stands for lysergic acid diamide. Uh, uh, diethylamide. And what they discovered that this drug acts mostly as a dopaminergic agonist. In other words, it, it acts similar to dopamine. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And the powers that be uh, created this narrative that, oh, look at those hippies, they're fully out of control. It's because they're because of their you know dopaminergic state, because of the, their abuse of the LSD drug. So we need to create something that that acts in a way opposite to LSD. And they came up with the serotonergic drugs. And the narrative was to take the serotonin drug, it'll make you calm, agreeable, and you know, and basically a, a person that can live and work within a group. While in reality, it really basically um, turns you into a robot. And if your serotonin gets to a, to, to a high enough level, eventually you become violent. And, and I, I don't know if, how many people have seen the news, but most of the mass shooters that, are, that, that, ha that happen, most of the mass shootings that happen in the States over the last 20 years, um, every single one of these mass shooters was on, at on uh, taken at least one serotonergic drug chronically. Right. Um, yeah. So, but nobody, nobody's raising the question is whether the drug was really responsible for, for, for creating these, these mass shootings, because how come these people were quiet one day and suddenly they lost their mind? Like, mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen that way. You know, in psychiatry, you know, insanity is take, they, they take decades to develop. So these people flip just, just like they flipped the switch. The only plausible explanation was that, you know, either they took too much of that drug or, you know, they, maybe they had a few drinks more, which slows down the degradation of these serotonin drugs. So their serotonin climbed to the critical point after which they became, you know, uncontrollably violent. But that's not a popular topic for any doctor or any, or any politician really, because you're striking at the heart of a multi-billion dollar industry. Industry, yeah. Well, and then, okay, so serotonin syndrome, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't, when that elevated serotonin gets to a certain level, like you said, it becomes like this irritation, agitation, like uh, violence. Um, isn't that what serotonin syndrome is? And could it be that it's actually more prevalent than we think because of how, you know, road rage and people are so angry all the time? And I talk to a lot of people that have this chronic ongoing anxiety that makes them irritated. And so I wanted to touch also on how serotonin is related to that irritating anxiety, that yep. inner ball of tension that some people have. So, so yeah, absolutely. Actually, serotonin syndrome can be, can be lethal if it's not treated uh, um, soon enough. It really depends on the severity as well. But if you go to the emergency room and if you get diagnosed with serotonin syndrome, you immediately get hooked on an IV and you start getting intravenous delivery of cyproheptadine, which is a right. serotonin blocker, a serotonin antagonist. Mm -hmm. And doctors know, are very well aware of serotonin syndrome, and they treat it as something very, very serious. And it's a known side effect of these serotonergic drugs. In fact, some of them carry a black box warning, which is the, you know, uh, the, the, the highest warning that FDA issues. In other words, the drug can kill you. And it basically says, don't, don't take this drug and then take it with anything else that inhibits certain enzymes that, that, degrade, that, that degrade serotonin. Um, and, and basically, um, there was a... Um, there was an epidemic in the early 90s of something called allergic uh, eosinophilic myalgia and 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 the official the official statement uh, all the people who developed it uh, they essentially had serotonin syndrome um and all the people who developed it developed it after taking the the the, um, the supplement l-tryptophan um and and the way the fda got got around this said oh they were taking a, a supplement that was tainted with an unknown contaminant that caused this condition. Mm -hmm. Yet all of these people had essentially serotonin syndrome and, and some of them died from it. And this contaminant that FDA claimed was in the supplement was never really discovered. So what FDA did, they basically banned the sale of L-tryptophan and now the only thing you can buy over the counter is 5-HTP, uh, right. which is basically a precursor to, uh, to, to L-tryptophan. Um, but really, the, the story, the moral of the story is if you take drugs or chemicals that elevate serotonin in the brain, you can actually die pretty easily if you take, if you take a high enough dosage. And, and the authorities are, are not shy to tell you about this. They just don't want to promote the idea that serotonin is dangerous because currently all of the drugs that are approved for depression, treatment of depression in the Western world, act, uh, they're, all, they're, all, they're all serotonergic. Now they do have these hidden mechanisms of action, which I, I said are likely responsible for the antidepressant effect, but those are not mentioned because then it would mean admitting that these drugs actually work by blocking serotonin. That's how they are anti, an antidepressant. So the public will start asking the questions of, well, if serotonin is really the cause of depression, 
then why are we being told to elevate it? Well, mm -hmm. um, incompetence is probably the biggest reason, but um, uh, the powers that be like serotonergic people because you essentially, you, you don't have much energy, you're content in just doing your work and just, you know, going home and, and tuning out and basically, you know, falling asleep, even if you can't sleep, because we'll, talk, we'll touch upon that later on, how serotonin prevents you from properly sleeping. Right. Just, you know, going to bed, closing your eyes, um, waking up every hour, or every two hours. It's really not a restorative sleep. And then the next morning, the whole thing starts all over again. So serotonin is not something that I would voluntarily uh, do anything to raise inside my organism. And I don't advise anybody to do the same. And speaking of sleep, so yes, serotonin is the precursor of melatonin. But the very reason melatonin exists inside our organisms and most mammals um, is it basically shifts shifts the, the 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 tone of the body away from serotonin. So melatonin is a metabolite of serotonin. So the more melatonin you produce, the less serotonin you have left. Mm. So serotonin that's 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 uh, that's something that's a way of of our body telling you um, we don't want too much serotonin. You know, if you have too much serotonin, I'll do everything I can to get rid of it. One way is to degrade it to an enzyme called monoamine oxidase type A uh, and type B as well, but mostly type A. And then the second way is by, by synthesizing melatonin. However, if your serotonin it elevates to uh, beyond a certain level, it actually starts to block that enzyme that synthesizes melatonin. So it interferes powerfully with your sleep. And it's not a coincidence that many people who take SSRI drugs, the serotonergic drugs for depression, they suffer from very poor sleep. And the official explanation is that it's the depression causing issues with sleep, right? But the direct cause of it is actually the highly elevated serotonin, which prevents proper melatonin synthesis. So these people are in a state of hibernation, which uh, in case uh, some, somebody, uh, people, the, your listeners don't know, it is not a state of deep sleep. It's actually a state of very light sleep. And if you get into the den of a hibernating bear, you, may, you can very easily wake it up and you'll be really, really vicious and attack you. Uh, and that, that's because of the elevated serotonin. But back to the sleep, basically serotonin prevents you from getting the deep restorative sleep that is known to occur in people with high melatonin levels. Mm -hmm. Children have high melatonin levels and low serotonin. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people with good high metabolism, with high thyroid, they have high melatonin and low serotonin. So in general, serotonin is something that the body reserves for emergency situations. So clearly you don't want to elevate something that serves as an emergency signal and keep it elevated at all times. Yes, that makes complete sense. And I'm wondering if the, the chronic exposure to things like blue light and we're always around a device actually can contribute to elevated serotonin because I do know I've read studies that it depletes dopamine. So I would assume that anytime you deplete dopamine, you're actually going to have a higher rate of serotonin, yes? Yes, absolutely. So it does two things, at least two things that are that, that are not good for us. Number one, it blocks the enzyme that synthesizes dopamine, which is mm -hmm. tyrosine hydroxylase. Okay. And uh, because dopamine itself blocks the synthesis of serotonin, anytime your dopamine goes down, that, that, that removes the breaks on the synthesis of serotonin. So serotonin itself, the synthesis of serotonin it's, itself will accelerate. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't bad enough, Blue light actually accelerates the activity of the enzyme synthesizing serotonin. So you get even more serotonin at the expense of dopamine and at the expense of melatonin. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure you've seen the studies and many people have probably already seen the studies that blue light is bad for sleep. Yes. Well, if serotonin was so good for sleep, then, then, then and basically how come blue light is bad for us given that its effects are, it blocks the synthesis of melatonin and it blocks the synthesis of dopamine, and it raises the synthesis of serotonin. So clearly serotonin is not good for sleep. And I want to mention two recent studies that came out. One of them was, a, was actually a, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a study, it was a court trial. It was, um, it was a trial, it was a criminal trial of a young adult who shot a few people. Uh, none, none of them died, but basically, uh, I think it was somewhere in um, Mississippi. I'll send you the link. Okay. And the defense, his defense lawyer successfully argued that, that, that his client is innocent by reasons of insanity. And, and even though the, the, the psychiatric panel that looked at the, they examined the individual said that this person is not insane, they're perfectly capable of comprehending uh, their actions. But the lawyer said, my, your honor, my client is on a high dose of, of an SSRI drug and SSRI drugs and serotonergic drugs are known 
to remove the ability to experience love and empathy completely. <laughs> um, it erases wisdom and in general knowledge about the world around us and also makes us so callous that basically he listed, this lawyer listed some studies saying that um, uh, a person who, who's, whose serotonin levels reach certain, uh, whose serotonin levels be, uh, reach beyond a certain point, then these people cannot be considered responsible for, for, their, for their actions, <laughs> even though they're not clinically trained. And, 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 and the trial was successful. This person was mm -hmm. successfully acquitted because the clinical evidence was unequivocal. It was, it was obvious. It was right there. Of course, you don't see that publicized on JAMA or Nature or New England Journal of Medicine that a person got acquitted by reasons of insanity yes. simply because their serotonin was too high. And a, another uh, thing I wanted to mention, a study that recently came out was it found that um, aquatic life um, that, that basically lives in the shallow areas of the oceans close to the, close to the, beach, to the beaches, close to land, is exposed to very low levels of, of all kinds of drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, mm -hmm. that, that, are, that, are, that, that got into the water through, through sewage, right? Mm -hmm. And because most plants, most processing, water processing plants are not equipped to filter these out. So they mm -hmm. get into the groundwater and eventually they get into the oceans. And it found that, uh, the, the study found that crabs and, and fish and even dolphin that are exposed to minute quantities of these serotonergic drugs became homicidal, cannibalistic, um, basically completely destroyed the social structures of these animals and they had a highly, highly evolved social lives. They, some of them live, live in colonies similar to beehives, right? Mm -hmm. so, the, so the social structure is, and even a, a minute exposure to serotonergic drugs completely dissolved that. It turned these animals uh, on each other and they started killing and eating each other. Even dolphins who are, don't have even the the, 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 the equipment, they don't have the teeth to devour each other, yet they turn on each other and started, started ripping each other to pieces. That's what mm -hmm. serotonin does, even in minute quantities, when, when, when done chronically. Yeah, you're going to have to send me that study too, because I don't doubt it. There was actually something in the news recently about a dolphin attacked someone, and that normally doesn't happen. They don't attack people. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes, it's really sad, but it makes sense. Um, so, talking about sleep, I, I know it, if you don't sleep, that also creates anxiety. But how does serotonin um, play into the anxiety that we're seeing today? Because I can't tell you how many people come to me and one of their big issues is anxiety. So serotonin actually has a bit of a numbing effect on your senses. Mm -hmm. So for people that are really, really anxious, uh, such as people that have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, there, the current, there's currently no approved drugs except two drugs that are serotonergic, two SSRI drugs. And what they do is because they make these people numb, um, they can actually sometimes paradoxically help in extreme cases of anxiety where this person is really shaking to the point where they're afraid to leave the house mm -hmm. simply because they're constantly processing memories of, of, of these traumatic events. Mm -hmm. So what serotonin does is it turns off the higher cognitive function. So actually in a very lo lobotomo, uh, it's almost like a lobotomy situation <laughs> where it removes that portion, it turns off that portion of the brain that processes the traumatic memory. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in a very perverted way, it may help people with PTSD. But what serotonin also does, it, it, it shuts off the production of the key inhibitory neurotransmitter known as GABA, gamma mm -hmm. amino butyric acid. Mm -hmm. And without GABA, you automatically enter a state of chronic anxiety. GABA is the calming neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, drugs that work on the GABA system such as the benzodiazepines, mm -hmm. have been the key anti-anxiety drugs since the 50s. Right. I think most of you listeners are familiar with, um, with the drugs like Valium and Xanax mm -hmm. and Clonopin. Uh, mm -hmm. its, its medical name is Clonazepine. Mm -hmm. So all of these drugs act as GABA agonists. So if serotonin is turning off the production of GABA, of the endogenous GABA, then you basically get into a situation of chronic GABA deficiency and that, that by definition puts you in a state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. There is, so GABA is, is inversely correlated with another um, neurotransmitter called glutamate. Glutamate mm -hmm. is the excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Anytime GABA goes down, glutamate goes up. So glutamate both contributes to anxiety and also prevents you from relaxing. So yes. that's what serotonin does. It turns off your ability to process uh, events that are happening around you in your life, while at the same time 
it makes you chronically anxious and chronically overexcited, yet it removes the ability, the cognitive ability for you to control your actions. It's almost like, you know, and, and if this, obviously, if this is done at the extreme, it creates a perfect homicidal robot or a violent creature that yeah. is incapable of neither controlling its actions, nor uh, it's also not even capable of analyzing the consequences of its actions. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really not a good situation. I mean, there is, there is no reason for serotonin to be promoted for any condition. And there have been multiple recent studies that came out, which basically said, uh, oh, oh my God, we we're all wrong. We got it all wrong. Serotonin is not something we should be targeting. Um, and then, of course, they, they, uh, they quoted these studies, which I found as well, that the successful antidepressant drugs are actually partial serotonin antagonists. They block the synthesis of cortisol. So really serotonin itself, by itself, they, uh, there was an article that came recently in JAMA, and the title was Serotonin. Is it an upper or downer? In other mm. words, is it an antidepressant or a depressant? And the article concluded overwhelmingly that all the evidence that we have so far, the unbiased evidence, the evidence that was not sponsored by Big Pharma, points unequivocally to serotonin being a potent depressant chemical. Mm -hmm. So not something you want to elevate by any means beyond what is minimally necessary for proper GI function. And I think if you're talking in terms of like um, elevating it to a level of like that chronic anxiety, the low GABA, the feeling of agitation and stuff, um, somebody who even, it doesn't even have to be violent. It could be individuals that just lash out every time or they snap every time somebody says something and they say words that they don't want to say and they have ta tantrums even in their 30s and 40s, you know, because <laughs> I actually are, am aware of quite a few people like that. And so I'm wondering if, if, they would benefit from somehow, you know, really, instead of working on a diet, but ma maybe actually doing habits that lower serotonin. So can you talk about some habits? And then maybe we'll touch on food too, but I definitely want to look at some lifestyle behaviors that might actually help to lower serotonin. Absolutely. Um, so one of the key aspects of serotonin is that promotes routine, mm -hmm. and routine also promotes serotonin. So doing, um, doing at least one unplanned thing per day helps a lot, helps break mm -hmm. out of this routine. Um, and it has to be spontaneous. So, mm -hmm. now of course, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have to be, uh, I, would, I wouldn't recommend a dangerous activity because that can also promote serotonin in, in its own right if it's something really scary, right? Uh, so I wouldn't jump out of airplanes with mm -hmm. parachutes and things like that. But, you know, if you, if you woke up one day and you felt like, you know, hey, I want to go and see a movie today or hey, I want to go for a walk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if it's not in your schedule, that's actually kind of the point. Um, yeah. As long as it's not disruptive to your normal lifestyle, um, I, would, I would do at least one unplanned thing daily. Um, doing creative social things, such as, you know, basically uh, hosting parties. Now, that involves some planning and routine, but in general, after the party starts, as everybody knows, it's pretty unpredictable. <laughs> so... <laughs> Basically, exposing yourselves to, to spontaneous, unpredictable events that are largely positive in nature. Um, so okay. being around people that you love, uh, or at the very least, people that don't annoy you, that you <laughs> feel like they're actually, they're, they're a positive force in your life. That's yeah. huge. I mean, all yeah, of this actually so acts on a very primal level on your serotonergic and dopaminergic system. Mm -hmm. um, every time you go out with a person you like and you do an unplanned activity, that's dopamine working yeah. uh, and serotonin is suppressed. Really, mm -hmm. if your serotonin is high, you, you're incapable of doing spontaneous things. And if, in fact, you resent them. So okay. it's not a coincidence that people who are on serotonergic drugs, they, they basically, they just want to stick to their routine. And anybody who tries to interfere in that routine is met with, 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 with uh, they either snap or they even become violent. Yeah. Because it's, initially, it's hard to get them to snap them out of that routine. But over time, over a few weeks, it doesn't take that long, doing unplanned, spontaneous things, uh, making sure you consume enough protein, mm -hmm. because basically uh, when you eat sufficient protein, and it's been shown that um, you, the, your daily intake of protein should not fall below one gram per kilogram of body weight, mm -hmm. because anything below that, you basically start to synthesize more serotonin than dopamine. Mm -hmm. And since serotonin and dopamine are both derived from amino acids that are found in protein, that's why protein, you know, decent protein intake is key. Um, keeping uh, fat intake um, to no more than 20% is also important. 
The reason for that is that whenever you ingest a fat heavy meal, what happens is that uh, the amino acid that's precursor to serotonin is called tryptophan, and typically it, it, it circulates in your blood bound to a protein called albumin. Mm -hmm. Now, when the blood is flooded with fat from, the, from a meal that you just had, if it's a very high fat, not high, but if it's a high fat meal, uh, basically fat also has an affinity for albumin and displaces, it, it kicks tryptophan out of that bond, so tryptophan starts floating freely in the blood. And then when it starts circulating uh, around the brain, Tryptophan is capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier. And if mm -hmm. there is enough tryptophan in your blood, it floods the, the brain with more tryptophan. And then it has been shown that the enzyme that synthesizes serotonin, uh, it can take as, as much tryptophan as you throw at it. So mm -hmm. if, you take, if your brain receives more tryptophan, it will synthesize more serotonin. Now, there are other amino acids that are precursors to dopamine, which compete, which compete with tryptophan for entry into the brain. And those amino acids are, are phenylalanine and tyrosine. They're also found in protein. Mm -hmm. So every time you eat protein, it typically contains more phenylalanine, phenylalanine and tyrosine than it, than it contains tryptophan. So typically, dopamine out, the dopamine precursors outcompete the serotonin precursor for entry into the brain. But if you don't eat enough protein or mm -hmm. if you eat too much fat, then tryptophan, start, tryptophan starts to become dominant and you, you're giving yourself a serotonergic condition. Not to the point of violence, but still, it will, it will, be, it will elevate serotonin to the point where you'll, you'll, you'll feel fatigued and you won't feel like doing much. And basically, you'll just want to go home and collapse and then start your normal routine all over again tomorrow. So yeah, so a proper diet. Um, caffeine is actually also good because it helps to limit the activity of the enzyme that synthesizes serotonin, especially under stress. So it's not a coincidence that people who are under stress smoke, tend to smoke and drink a lot of coffee. Both of these things limit the synthesis of serotonin in the brain. So uh, as I, would, I would vouch for coffee. I mean, I can't officially <laughs> recommend smoking, but there is a reason why people do it. It's yeah. not just a vice. Most people subconsciously self-medicate with various substances when they're under stress and smoking and, and caffeine are, are, are two of the most accessible drugs for that. So fascinating. And I'm so glad you mentioned coffee because I'm drinking some right now at little K's coffee shop that I'm at. But yes, coffee, I mean, that's always been something that actually calmed me. It didn't agitate me. But I'll tell you, back in my bodybuilding days, back when you take that gallon of water and you carry it around with you and you drink water all day, that actually made me feel agitated. Like I, it wasn't that I didn't want to drink the water, but something about it made me my day more agitating. And I'm wondering if it was because the water intake, when you're drinking too much water, I'm assuming that too much water actually can raise serotonin. Is that true? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Do you know how? So it actually does so directly. Um, so there is a protein, it's called the serotonin transporter, which is responsible for deactivating serotonin, for basically getting serotonin and shoving it back into the synapse, which is a, a cell in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is that this, this protein, the serotonin transporter, it's highly dependent on sodium for proper function. Mm -hmm. So anytime your sodium levels drop, this, this protein will not work as well. So more serotonin will remain active. Yes. So of course, when you drink a gallon of water, <laughs> guess, what, guess what happens with your electrolytes? I mean, you, 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 they, they <laughs> drop at the very least sodium and calcium. And, and, and probably mag uh, sodium, calcium, and magnesium, they all drop to a very low level. Potassium is mostly inside the cell, but anything that, 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 you know, that is outside the cell or easily can get outside of the cell, it gets flooded and you basically you pee it out. Mm -hmm. So this drinking a gallon of water, this is excessive. I mean, uh, you, most people need about half a gallon a day, and that's from all liquids combined. Keep in mind, we, we, well. we get liquids through food as well. Mm -hmm. that, needs to be, that needs to be taken into account. Drinking a gallon of water on top of what everything we do, the only thing this will do is, is get you into a, into a serotonergic state, and it can actually be very, very dangerous. Um, not sure, as, a, as an athlete, you've probably ran a few marathons. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you've noticed, but now they've started to have an, an actual MD, a doctor, who meets people at the finish line and makes sure that these people don't overconsume water. And if they do drink liquids, the doctor actually advocates that they drink electrolyte, electrolyte drinks like Gatorade or, or anything else that contains electrolytes because there have been a few death cases 
from, uh, because people have drank too much water to the point that their sodium and potassium levels got critically low and they went into a cardiac arrest. So, so that's what water can do, especially since when you're running, you're also expelling these electrolytes to sweat. And if you drink a gallon of water at the finish line, this is actually very dangerous. Drinking pure water, um, I think drinking uh, about a liter of pure water was actually a test, uh, an old test used back in the 40s uh, for seizure susceptibility. Mm -hmm. So basically this was, if you drink a, a liter of water and you start seizing up or you know the doctors feel like you're about to get a seizure, it means your metabolism is very low or your electrolytes are low and they immediately hook you to an IV and give you extra electrolytes. So water in excess can be very dangerous and one mechanism is the serotonergic mechanism. Yeah, I, I had to be careful that when I ran, I just ran half marathons, but I would actually carry, and even when I do long paddles on my paddleboard, I carry like a bag of salt with me. So I would, instead of snacking on goose like people do, I actually just pop salt. That way I can drink water without yeah. totally obliterating myself because I've been there, done that. So. Another great drink which you may, you may want to try yourself, and if you like, I recommend to your listeners, is putting a, a little bit of baking soda in orange juice. Okay. So orange juice itself, very rich in potassium and it has a decent amount of magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also contains calcium as well. Mm -hmm. So by adding the baking soda, you, not only you get sodium, but you also you're carbonating it. So you're getting a little bit of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. as well. And it tastes really good. It doesn't taste salty because, because of the citric acid in orange juice, it masks the taste of salt. And actually it's a really nice pungent, it's got a nice pungent kick to it and you don't feel the saltiness. And so I know some people gag on salt, but this one doesn't 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 feel that way. It's actually pretty pretty pleasant to drink. Like a teaspoon of baking soda per glass of orange juice is all that's needed. Wow, I'm gonna have to try that because I like anything fizzy anyway. So it sounds like it'd make it a little bit fizzy too. So that's a good idea. That's yeah, a just good make kind sure of that when you're drink. making it. Yeah, when you're making it, put it in a larger container because when you dump the baking soda, oh, it's sure. gonna start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned proteins are good, um, fats are, we want to keep them moderate, but what foods specifically do we need to avoid when it comes to serotonin? Are there specific foods we should look out for that we should completely avoid? Yes, as I mentioned, serotonin has a very tight relationship with endotoxin, mm -hmm. and as we know, endotoxin is produced mostly in the colon. So um, anytime you eat food that, is, that, that arrives at the colon partially or fully undigested, it becomes food for the bacteria there. And anytime you feed that bacteria, it produces endotoxin. Anytime this endotoxin uh, uh, interacts with the a wall of the intestine or even gets into your bloodstream, that immediately triggers the production of serotonin. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, I would avoid foods that are difficult to digest. These resistant carbs that you've been yeah. sold on for the last 10 to 15, mm -hmm. maybe even 20 years, they're really not that good for you. They're good for the bacteria in your column. <laughs> and it, they, it, some people have been promoting them for exactly for that reason. They're saying, well, you want the, your microbiome to be happy. Yes, but uh, it also happens to produce a lot of endotoxin when you feed it uh, these resistant carbs. And we are the ones paying the price for it. Um, and in fact, some people with, with severe gut dysbiosis have found tremendous relief by taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, and some people have even recovered from depression by taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And the reason is when you destroy this bacteria in your colon, since 90% of the serotonin is produced in your gut, basically 90% of the serotonin is gone. So you are a nice, happy, dopaminergic person. <laughs> now, I wouldn't recommend this you know, as a, as a go-to method for every person. I think on a daily basis, we should simply be cognizant of what we eat and, and avoid the, the resistant carbs um, that, that basically get to the colon undigested. So we should be, if, if, we're, if, if we'll be eating carbs, it's best that these carbs come from ripe fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and second best would be um, easily digestible starches such as well-cooked white rice, mm -hmm. well-cooked potatoes, uh, white bread, you know, if you're not sensitive to gluten, that works well, uh, mm -hmm. that, that also works well. But definitely not the full grain breads, um, definitely not semi-cooked beans mm -hmm. or lentils, Mm -hmm. uh, which are very popular with the vegan or even the paleo community because they're considered low glycemic index foods. I would I would stay away from these because uh, and and a good sign would be gas. Anytime you you feel like you're you're getting gas from a food, that's a sign that you 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 just fed your bacteria in the column because okay. that's what the, that's where this gas is coming from. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a byproduct of bacterial metabolism. 
So yeah, so gas is not just smelly, it's also informative. So <laughs> you can let yourself know that you're not eating the right foods. What about like the um, just vegetables? You know, a lot of people just eat vegetables, but they're uncooked. Probably they should eat them well cooked, you're saying, because that well way cooked, it's, it's going to be harder for the body to break down if they're, if they're raw. So a couple of things. First of all, all vegetables, they're living creatures before they were harvested. Right. And they have a preference of not being eaten, right. right? Unless you're eating the part of the vegetable that was meant to be eaten, such as, let's say, tomato is actually a fruit. But usually if you eat the part that contains the seeds, the vegetable or, or the plant has developed it in such a way so that you basically, an organism eats the, the fruit with the seeds, the, I mean, the part with the seeds, and then digests it in the foods, the, basically the seeds pass through undigested, and then, and then that's how the seeds are spread. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're eating a part of the plant that is not <laughs> meant to be eaten, it contains powerful enzymes which inhibit digestion. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one way the plant protects itself from various parasites, um, including humans. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it tells the organism of the invader, of the, of the aggressor, that you're not going to get much value from eating me. I'm going to inhibit your digestion and you will not extract much from me. And, and usually only the ruminant animals, actually, that's why they have a three-camera stomach, mm -hmm. because it takes all of this constant digestion, regurgitation, and then, you know, again, digestion, regurgitation. So ruminant animals, when they eat these vegetables, because essentially they eat grass and other vegetables as well, especially the leafy parts, they spend 12 to 16 hours just digesting, and they have a special stomach designed for the digestion. Right. Our stomachs are not, are not that way. So the best, uh, usually the best portions of the vegetables, if we eat, if, if we eat vegetables, are the root parts mm -hmm. for several reasons. First of all, the roots don't necessarily have the enzymes that block digestion, but they do have some, some natural antibiotics because the root wants to protect itself from the fungi, the viruses, and the bacteria that live in soil. Mm -hmm. So those enzymes in, uh, that, are, that have these anti-pathogen effects, they're also beneficial for us because they, uh, they have an antibacterial effect in the colon as well when we eat them. So uh, carrots are great, turnips I think are also great. Um, and if we eat the above ground portion of the vegetable, I think it should be well cooked because first of all, uh, because of the enzymes that inhibit digestion and also because these uh, vegetables by definition contain mostly PUFA, the polyunsaturated fats. And those are also powerfully anti-metabolic. Anti so by cooking those, uh, the vegetables, those fats get separated and you can actually eat just the leaves, just the vegetable part, which contains cellulose, fiber, you know, uh, um, it, uh, a lot of calcium, magnesium as well because of the chlorophyll. Um, so that's how we can actually assimilate and absorb these nutrients. When we eat the vegetables in a raw form, very little gets absorbed. It basically, we're eating mostly roughage and it may be good for digestion, um, for regularity, but not much beyond that, and they still feed the bacteria in the colon. <laughs> it's interesting when you mention PUFA, like nuts and seeds too, because when I, uh, probably back in 2008 was when I gave up peanut butter, and prior to then I had really bad road rage, and I was kind of angry a lot, <laughs> and I'm wondering if like when you switch away from PUFA, that also lowers your serotonin, because after that I got a lot calmer and a lot nicer too, so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there are a number of studies showing that the polyunsaturated fats um, have a direct stimulating effect on the enzyme that synthesizes serotonin from tryptophan. Mm -hmm. So it's a very direct pro-serotonin effect. Yeah. And I think we, we mentioned in, in your last podcast that uh, the polyunsaturated fats are also directly estrogenic, mm -hmm. um, and they also promote the synthesis of cortisol. And I already mentioned that cortisol and serotonin have a vicious loop once you start promoting, and estrogen does too. All of these are, are mediators of the stress response. Right. So anytime you elevate one of them by any means, it usually triggers the stress cascade. So we don't want to be eating foods that, that act on even one of these stress mediators. And PUFA happens to act on all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually anti-thyroid too, foods. So PUFA is right. very anti-thyroid. So yeah, definitely want to stay away from those. Um, so we talked strategies, we've talked food. Is there anything else that would, you know, these are great ways to also lower anxiety for people too. Are there any supplements people should watch out for or p possibly even supplements that they might want to think about adding in to help lower serotonin and lower anxiety? So in terms of uh, supplements to avoid, I would stay away from any supplement that contains things like silica, 
mm -hmm. hypromelose, um, um, magnesium sparate, all of these are adjuvants, all of these are excipients, which uh, when they get into your GI tract, they, they have an irritating effect. And anytime the, the intestine is irritated, it starts synthesizing serotonin. Now, the primary irrit irritant is usually endotoxin, but it doesn't have to be. In general, anything that gets into your GI tract and cannot be digested acts as an irritant. And silica is actually powder glass. I think it's rather easy for people to see why eating powder glass may not be very good for, for, your, for your intestinal system. Right. I mean, it causes these minor tears, yeah. uh, microbleed, and basically you can actually get a false positive test for, for colon cancer if mm. you're consuming the wrong supplement. Basically, if it has enough silica, you will get in sufficient enough microbleeding in your GI tract that this will get diagnosed on the test as a occult bleeding and then the doctor will say, oops, we have to examine you because, you know, that's the test says that this could be a sign of, a, of, of a, a bowel cancer. It could be not just the colon, but any, any portion of the GI tract. Mm -hmm. um, so I would avoid, I would, I, would, I would try to consume supplements uh, that have the, you know, if, if possible, no additives. But if they contain a, any of these additives, I would definitely avoid them. And in terms of supplements that may help uh, control serotonin, um, I mean, basically vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin K are all known to have anti-serotonin effects. Um, let's see, uh, vitamin E, because it, it's known to oppose estrogen, it may have a, a basically an indirect anti-serotonin effect, and also it, it, it deactivates and, and degrade, helps degrade PUFA. So mm -hmm. it, it may have an indirect anti-serotonin effect. Vitamin B1, also known as thiamine, is a cofactor for a number of enzymes in the body, and consuming vitamin B1 um, helps raise carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide it acts similar to that serotonin transporter protein that I mentioned earlier. It helps to deactivate serotonin. In fact, vitamin B1, there are older studies from the 60s and 70s, and actually even, even from the 50s, um, where they used high doses vitamin B1 for a number of, actually for any type of psych, psych, psychiatric condition, including bipolar disorder and psychosis, both of them at this point are known uh, to be caused by serotonin. So by anything that elevates carbon dioxide will help decrease the activity of serotonin. So vitamin B1 is one, is one such vitamin, vitamin B2 and B3 are two other such, such vitamins. Mm -hmm. By the way, vitamin B2 has a special role because the enzyme that degrades serotonin monoamine oxidase type A is, mm -hmm. a, is an enzyme that depends on, on vitamin B2 and copper as cofactors. Mm -hmm. So anytime you consume more copper and or vitamin B2, you help this enzyme degrade serotonin. Um, high dose vitamin B2 is also known as riboflavin. So high dosage riboflavin is at this point approved as treatment for migraines in several countries. Uh, the dose is high, it's several hundred milligrams, it's not something that I would recommend people take on a daily basis, but because migraine is known to be caused by serotonin, this directly shows you that vitamin B2 has a direct anti-serotonin effect because it treats even very severe cases of migraines. Um, vitamin B6 can help, also known as uh, pyridoxine, can help synthesize more dopamine, and since mm -hmm. dopamine opposes serotonin, okay, this can be helpful. Biotin is a vitamin that uh, also increases the production of CO2. So these are all, these are all uh, supplements that, that, that can help with, uh, with either the degradation or deactivation of serotonin or at least limiting its effects. There are a number of other different supplements, but I think the primary way to control serotonin would be uh, in, to ensure spontaneity in your life, mm -hmm. avoid either irritating or indigestible foods, mm -hmm. um, and make sure that if you're, if you're taking any supplements, read the label carefully and make sure you avoid excipients that are known to cause GI damage. Those are the major ways through which serotonin rises. And of course, as much as possible, surround yourself with happy, healthy, creative, unburdened people um, because those have a direct and powerful anti-serotonin effect in your life, which probably dwarf, dwarfs the effect of any vitamin that you can take. 
Yes. Instead of being on Facebook, we need to be face to face. That's why I have a video on how to raise your dopamine. So anything you can do to get your dopamine up is going to counter that serotonin too. So yeah, doing those dopaminergic tasks and habits are really great. But since I know you won't plug yourself, I'm going to plug you with regard to when you mentioned vitamin A, D, E, and K, you have a product called Estroban that is wonderful. And that there's, there's all four of those that you just mentioned in one little dropper that you just put under your tongue or on your skin. And I think it's fantastic. It's just a blend of A, D, E, and K. So they can check that out. Um, I'll be giving your information. And then also your supplement Energin, which is the B vitamins you recommended. And I'm a big fan of both of those because they do exactly as they're told. They do whatever you say that they're going to do in the body, they actually do. I've seen it not only just in myself, but in many clients. So I appreciate those products. So why don't I let you tell them where they can find your supplements just so they know? Yeah, we have a website. It's uh, Our company name is Idea Labs. And the website is very easy. It's, it's the name of the company, Idea Labs followed by the letters DC, Diaz and Dogs, Diaz and Charlie, because we're located in Washington, D.C. So it's idealabsdc.com. Mm-hmm. And just as I mentioned, because we're very well aware of, these, of, of the powerful negative effects excipients can have on digestion and thus on serotonin as well, all of our products are liquid and they contain nothing except the active ingredients and a solvent, which is either water or pure grain alcohol or in some cases, a little bit of saturated fat. That's all we use. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a number of different products, but I, I think just as you mentioned, Energen and, and Estroban would be the two I would start with. And they happen to also be the cheapest. So it's yeah. a, it would be a great, a great thing to try and, and see if it works. It's a win-win that way. Yeah. So, well, that's wonderful. I think this has been a wealth of information as usual. So I appreciate your time today. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll have you send me some of those links that we mentioned and that way they can check out some of these studies too. And we'll have you back again because I absolutely love talking to you. You're just a huge fun uh, bag of information that I just can't get enough of your, your, your brain. So, <laughs> so thank you Likewise. so much. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and we'll talk again soon. Bye for now. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for listening. (laughs) Hey out there, I'm about to drop one more bit of knowledge about why you should drop an F-bomb. So I have ripped open a packet of coconut oil here, but I'm not going to eat it. I am going to use it as a little natural moisturizer. So you know how when you travel, you don't want to take a whole lot, especially nowadays, they only let you take a carry-on. And maybe you're just going away for the weekend and you need some moisturizer, you need some sunscreen to take with you. Well, guess what? Coconut oil is kind of nature's sunscreen. So you pack one of these little bad boys with you and not only can you eat it, but you can put it on your skin. And it's nature's best sunscreen because it's a natural way to protect from the sun in a low grade way so you can stay out all day, get a little color, but not get burnt. Also, maybe after the gym you want to moisturize and then head to work, you can use this. Maybe you need uh, to get a little dryness out of your hair. This is a wonderful way to saturate the hair and really soothe the hair. Pour it all over your head, let it sit with a shower cap for a couple hours, and then rinse it out and wash it, and you're gonna have really soft, silky hair. And your scalp will be soothed too. If you have kind of itchy scalp, coconut oil is great for that. There are so many great reasons to have a packet of coconut oil with you, not just for eating, but also for body and skincare purposes. Works great as a face oil and a body oil. So check out dropanfbomb.com and get some of these handy dandy little packets to keep with you. Even if you're not into eating it, you're gonna find it really beneficial to just take on the go with you. Oh, also you can use my code GETFIT, G-E-T-F-I-T, to save 20%. Thanks for watching.